Well, as we continue, again, exploring the person, teachings, impact of Jesus Christ in the book of Luke. We're in chapter 5 right now. And we've looked at Jesus' call of Peter and Andrew and James and John, where he said, follow me. And then we looked at the two healing miracles that happened, happened just after this, where we saw the person who had been healed of, of both um, being having the disease of leprosy and also the paralyzed man. So Jesus calls his disciples. He heals a person with leprosy. He heals a person who's been paralyzed. And then we find him in verse 27. And so let me, let me read that to you. It says, after this, so after he healed the paralyzed man and the man with leprosy, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them. He said, Those who are well are in no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He said, I have come to call, to, not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So once again, what we're seeing here, Jesus, or, or, or Luke reveals a pattern here in Jesus' ministry. He reaches out to those on the fringe, on the edge in our society. First, it was those with the physical limitations. And, and, and those that are seen as social outcasts. So Jesus reaches out here, and he calls a tax collector. Now, tax collectors in the Jewish culture were seen as absolute traitors of Israel. There were people who had betrayed their people, and they were seen as very notorious sinners. The question that is being faced here in this passage is whether Jesus and the, the followers of, of Jesus, Jesus and his disciples, should practice this kind of separation like the Pharisees do. So that's the question that, that comes here in this passage. We're going we're gonna to see it again in chapter 15. We're going to see it in chapter 18. We're going to see it in chapter 19. Should followers of Jesus separate themselves from sinners? Now, what Levi represents in this passage is the successful outcome of a call to repentance. That's what happens here in this passage. What happens when somebody successfully answers the call of repentance? So sometime after healing the paralyzed man and the person with uh, uh, leprosy, Jesus goes out from Capernaum and he sees a tax collector. Now, is it the first time he had seen him? No, Jesus has been headquartered here in Capernaum. I've been to Capernaum. I don't know. It's not like Dallas or any other major city. I don't know how many ways there are in and out of the city of Dallas, but there's a lot. Well, in those days, it wasn't very smart to have very many ways in or out of the city. Why? Because you were constantly trying to protect your city. You know how many ways there were out of Capernaum and into Capernaum? One. There was a big wall, and there's a big gate, and you came in and out of this gate. I have, a, I have a picture of it that I should have found this week, but I didn't. But I've walked this short distance. It's, it, the, 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 the place where Matthew's tax booth was was probably 
somewhere between about here to the back wall and back up. It's not that long a place. So I remember walking up and down those rocks thinking, somewhere in here, Jesus called Matthew. And so they actually have a little tax booth kind of set up there, but I don't know if that's not the one, obviously. But somewhere in here. So Jesus had walked past this man probably dozens of times. Matthew was well aware of what was going on in Jesus' ministry. He had heard of the man. He had heard of the miracles. He had heard the teachings. He had heard of the, the healings. And so Matthew is sitting here. His job is collect taxes. So if you went from one city or the other, his job was to collect taxes from you for carrying commerce between the cities. So Matthew is despised. I mean, what if you wanted to go to Dallas, Fort Worth, and you wanted to carry whatever your you know, job may be. So say you're carrying uh, a load of sheetrock from Dallas to Fort Worth, and some guy pulls you over and says, $20. And you say, I don't have $20. I only have $15. Well, I'll take all that. You don't get to eat today. You know, whatever. So you've got this guy that... That, that the government is hired to take what money he can get from you. You wouldn't like that person very much. And the disciples walking with Jesus, they didn't like this guy very much. And they're walking out of Capernaum one day, and Jesus looks to this man and says, follow me. This is common in, in Luke. He's already said it in chapter 5. We're going to see it again in chapter 9 twice in chapter 18. This is a familiar saying of Jesus, follow me. So in effect, what Jesus has done is said, Matthew, Levi, become one of my disciples. So just as we saw last week, <coughs> that sinners can come into... Uh, a, a, a relationship, an intimate relationship with God, so can tax collectors. In other words, what I want you to hear today is that anyone who responds to Jesus can receive his blessing. Anyone who responds to Jesus, how? In repentance and trust, can receive his blessing. So I want you to be clear when you walk out of here today, what must I do to receive the blessing of God? Where is the list, Pastor? Where can you show me what I must do to receive blessing in my life? There is only two things, repentance and faith. Also could be said as trust. That's it. What more must I do to receive God's blessing in my life? There's nothing you can do. More than that. It, that. That's all that Matthew does here. So in other words, anyone who responds to Jesus can receive his blessing. Levi responds to the invitation of Jesus, leaving his profession, leaving his financial security behind to follow Jesus. Now, I don't have time for it, and I don't want to go into this, but there's a clear difference in the word all and the word everything in the Bible. And I've stressed that the word all means all, right? But everything doesn't mean all, okay? If anyone tells you you have to give up all that you have to follow Jesus like Matthew did, that's not what it says. He gave up everything. He left his profession and his, his livelihood in this case because it was a sinful profession. Okay? A lot of people say you have to give up all. You have to give up your home. You have to give up your money. You have to give up everything. Like John the Baptist, go live out in the desert to be a true follower, a monk, so to speak. We've seen that in the world. We still see that today, monks and nuns. That's not what the Bible says. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of things in the everything here that God's asking for people to give up. So I didn't want to go too far off track here, but I, I, I know sometimes people use this passage to say, if you want to be a real disciple, 
You have to give up all that you have. And there's a difference in the word all and the word everything here. So the relationships that Jesus makes causes some to raise questions, though, here. And we're going to see this a lot in this gospel. So it's the Pharisees. So they're going to take their complaints to the disciples. And the complaint is very direct and very clear here. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? In the ancient culture, in the culture that Jesus lived in, to sit down and have a meal with someone meant you accept them. That you're accepting of who they are. Okay? And so Jesus is sitting here and he's having a meal with these tax collectors and these sinners. And the reason that, that they're upset is they believe that what this means is, is that Jesus is endorsing who they are. So the two perspectives here cannot be more opposite of each other. The Pharisees prefer a level of isolation and separation from sinners. That's clear. We're going to see it all through the gospel. Jesus prefers to aim for the recovery of sinners. Pharisees say, let's separate from sinners. Jesus says, let's recover sinners. His actions suggest that the separation of the, that the Pharisees, this of separation doesn't honor God. So then he gives the reason for his actions. The image he uses is really kind of fundamental in, in pointing out the issue here. Jesus notes that a healthy person doesn't seek a physician. I, I, I agree with that. Now, all these worldly analogies somehow break down because I have met people who just go to the doctor all the time. Okay? Who, so that's not the person Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about most of us men in the room. Okay? Let me prove my point. If I'm going to the doctor, if I'm willing to go see a doctor, it means I'm sick. I'm really sick. I need help, and I can't help myself. So I think what Jesus should have said here, it's like you men who are unwilling to get help. When you go to the doctor, you're sick, you need help, and you can't help yourself. So this, this, this metaphor was, was well known in ancient times, though it may not be as, as well to us today. It was used in Chronicles and Jeremiah and Isaiah, the, the physician metaphor here. So, in other words, Jesus calls out to those who realize that they need help. To seek out sinners is to go to people who realize that they're not what they're supposed to be. But Jesus doesn't go to offer them encouragement. He's not sitting down with Pharisees and sinners to encourage them or to counsel them or to give them some comforting words. That's not what's going on. He calls them to repent. He's not encouraging who they are. He's not being among sinners because he likes being among people who commit sin. He's going to them because they need to hear his voice. And his voice is saying, repent. Change who you are. He calls them to repent. Repentance means a change of direction. It's a clear word used in the Greek. It means you're going one way and you turn around and you go the other. So Jesus calls on those who are not well, who know they're not well, who know that they need help, to get better by receiving God's grace. And so if they desire to know God, the Lord will not reject them, but will begin the process that will make them well. So hear this. Jesus reaches out to sinners because he sees the potential for their being renewed through God's grace. He sees something completely different than what the Pharisees could see. Jesus looked at these people, and he didn't see Pharisees. He didn't see whatever sins the others had committed. He saw in them potential for what they could be through God's grace. You know, Jesus knows this doesn't happen when people who've received God's grace seek to isolate themselves from lost people. His mission is to regain the lost by going to the lost. And this is what he does with Levi. 
He goes to him. And so there's several applications that are coming out of us, Ridgecrest. There's several things that we need to see, applications for, for us from Jesus' encounter with, with Levi. So first, I want you to notice Levi's response, both uh, following Jesus and then hosting this banquet for him. This is a man. I know, I know you've heard this story before. I know we, we probably, most of us have heard the story of Matthew, of Levi here, and the way he got up from the, the tax booth and followed Jesus. But this is what I need you to see. This is a man whose life was instantly, completely changed. Completely changed. He's a sinner. His life takes a complete turn because Jesus is who he is, and the, the, the thing I want you to see is what happens immediately is he can't wait to share Jesus with the lost people that he knows. He can't wait. You know, he, he, he gathers his friends. He gathers all the people he knew, all the people we might say that he used to hang out with, that he used to run with, and he brings them together. You know, this is... This is common even still today. Frequently new Christians, brand new Christians, that's who are our strongest evangelists. So in the first two years, they say, after a conversion, people typically share Jesus. But within two years of coming to know Jesus, people have stopped running with the same people, stopped hanging with the same crowd, stopped being with family members who don't know Jesus, so after a couple of years, they're not with anyone who doesn't know Jesus. And so the, 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 the thing that happens is all their friends and family are cut off from Christ. Jesus, though, he never was a sinner. So the comparison is not exact. Jesus was never a sinner. He never was part of the crowd, so that's not true of him, but he always extends himself towards others in such a way, has an association with them, that they might come to know him. And so, you know, I don't know the answer to why we do this. I, I, I suspect it's probably because we feel like if we hang out with people who commit sin, then we're going to commit the sins they commit. Uh, but, but we do. We isolate ourselves from sinners. This is just what the Pharisees did. What do we do when we isolate ourselves from sinners? Then we lose the opportunity to share Christ we lose the opportunity to see people turn their life around like Levi did. The second thing here to see is Jesus' initiation. Uh, it, 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 it's very revealing. He seeks sinners. Jesus shows us that reaching out to lost people is a priority. I, I've been... In enough churches, like I said, to know that most Christians avoid sinners rather than what? What Jesus is seeking them out. Uh, I mean, in, in a way, we run from them. We, 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 we have this sort of fear about being with, with lost people a lot of times. You know, maybe it's because of of what language is going to be spoken. Maybe they're going to cuss around us. Maybe they're going to tell some jokes that we shouldn't hear. Maybe they're going to talk about some movies that have things in them that we shouldn't be seeing. A, a lot of different reasons. You know, they're going to do some things that are going to make us uncomfortable. You know... And there, there's probably going to be things that we're invited to do with lost people that we're going to need to graciously say no to, right? Then we're going to need to, in a very Christian, gracious way, say, no, I, I can't do that. But there's also going to be a lot of opportunities, though it may be awkward, to share Christ with these people. You know, this is why, in, in my life, I've really admired a lot of what we call parachurch 
organizations, churches that are kind of outside the church, but they come alongside like the, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, parachurch organizations. You know, uh, and I've been involved in several in my life, but in high school there's Young Life and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And then in college, there's Campus Crusade and the Navigators. You know, these organizations do a great job of, a, of, of initiating outreach to lost people. In fact, you might say that's what they're all about, is outreach to lost people. For evangelism to be effective, unsaved people have to be reached, right? Right? I mean, if you're going to have an effective evangelism strategy, you need to be going to lost people. Because they're not looking to come to you. Matthew was not looking to come to Jesus. Jesus went to him. So, you know, we have to begin to think, how do we build bridges? You know, how do we get to lost people? How do we develop relationships with lost people? What? How do we develop relationships with lost people. Well, that's what Jesus was doing because it becomes an opportunity for sharing Christ with him. So the goal moves us closer to the desire that God has for all of us to function in. That's what we're to be, points of light. Those who point the way to the great physician. And so the attitude of the Pharisees in contrast here is it's, it's criticized in this text. And that's why Jesus said it. He said it in the way he did. They are, consul they, they are absolutely, completely concerned with their appearance. You know, let me make it more graphic. What if, what if you saw me down on Harry Hines talking to a prostitute? What would you think? We're going, to talk to, we're going to talk about that. What if I was sharing Jesus with her? And you overheard that. Would you think better? What if I was sitting down in uh, downtown and I'm sitting with a bunch of guys with a paper bag with a 40 ounce coming out of the top of it. And I'm sitting on the curb talking with them. I don't have a 40 ounce. But I'm sitting and talking with them. What are you going to think of me? I can tell you what most people would think. What in the world is that preacher doing down here talking to this prostitute? What in the world is he doing with those guys drinking beer? I could go on and on and get more graphic than that. But, but it, it's, it's, we think that way. I mean, it's, it's the automatic reaction. That would make me like the Pharisees, or it would make you like the Pharisees. I would be, I'm the one down talking to the guys with the 40 ounce. I'm going down and talking to the prostitute. You know, it, 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 what, what happens when we become this way? There's no witness, and then people are crushed or ignored in this process. Purity at the expense of serving people is not purity. If you're being pure causes you to stop serving unpure people, you're not pure. You're sinning. It is a sin to avoid sinful people. That's what Jesus is saying. It is not my practice. If I avoid sinful people, I am not a follower of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is against this kind of approach to engaging the world. Though the Pharisees have a devotion, it is a destructive devotion that ignores the needs of people. And then finally, our mission involves preaching the call of repentance to lost people. We must be very careful not just to try to help people. That's not a bad thing, helping people. But at the same time, we must be careful reaching out to those we may, it may seem well, but, but while we're reaching out to those who are hated, to those who are rejected, like Jesus does when he calls on Levi, we have to also be helping them to see the need to trust 
in Christ, but also repent of the sin that's in their life. You know, some of the most unsung heroes in the body of Christ are these people doing that. They're going to the inner city. They're going to the crack houses. They're going to the streets full of prostitutes. They're going to the prisons. They're going to these people who others would see them with and say, and judge them for being with those people. But whomever we seek to reach, we must offer the hope of the gospel at the same time. To give such a call involves humility in two ways. So as we go hear this, as we deliver this call, it requires humility in two ways. First of all, the person issuing the call is reminded of how God's grace is an act of surgical care extended to the believer. Okay, As we share the gospel, we're humbled by remembering that time when the great physician operated on us. Right? And let's admit, for some of us, it might have been like day surgery. But for some of us, we were in ICU and we required some critical organ transplant within us. But no matter how you remember it, you received a new heart. God reached into you and he took out that heart of stone and he put in a living heart, a heart that knew him. And so when we share the gospel, we, we need to be, we receive this humility in remembering the time that the great physician operated on us. You know, the one who shares Jesus knows what it means to be lost. Do you hear that? The people sharing Jesus have to be able to talk to a person about what it means to be lost. And I tell you, this should create such a sense of empathy in us for lost people. You know, and, 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 it, and it should encourage us to help people find the Lord. And then there's humility that's required from the person responding. You know, this is because to come to God for spiritual healing means to recognize one's need. To come to God, to come to the great physician means to recognize that there's something we don't have, that's something we need, some kind of healing we need. So the world, the world calls and says, wake up, take control of your life. Be a man, take control of your life, get your life straight. You're weak if you can't control your own life. Control your own finances. Control your own destiny. Control your family. All of these things the world says, get a grip. Get control of your life. And God says, give me control of your life. Give me control. Give me the ability to direct you. And when you do that, then he can restore you. They go hand in hand. If we give him the direction, we get the restoration. And that's what, he's, that's what Jesus is saying to Luke in two words. Follow me. I mean, Levi. Levi had seen the miracles. He had seen, he had heard the words. He had heard the teaching. He had seen the impact that Jesus was having on other people's lives. And Jesus said, follow me. And Levi said, how quick? Right now? Yes. And please, let me give you direction in my life. I'm going to give you my job. I'm going to give you my finances. And please come into my home. And please tell my lost friends about this incredible gift. You know, when God gives his grace to us and he begins to work in our lives, he wants to make us more servant-oriented. He wants to make us givers. He wants us to be more giving to others. Control, which the world is trying to make us better at, control is no longer our concern. Right? Control doesn't matter anymore. Loving others 
is what matters. So Levi's response to Jesus shows a complete change of direction. <coughs> Levi's heading one way, one day, the next, the next moment he's heading the other. And then the banquet he gives. This is a party like none other. The banquet he gives to Jesus is, is not just an expression of thanks. Though I think it is. But it's not just an expression of thanks. It's a recognition by him that since God gives so graciously that we should also. This is a beautiful picture of what happens when one comes to know Jesus Christ as their Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this story in the book of Luke. Thank you for Levi. We, we know him as Matthew, but Luke chooses to, to call him by the name Levi. Father, I just pray as people have heard this this morning that if there's somebody in this room that that entered in this morning heading one direction has seen what can happen when a person is offered the gift of grace that they would this very moment, this morning, accept this gift. They're not being asked to give up all that they have, but they're being asked to give God everything. And so, Father, I ask if there's one in this room this morning who hasn't given everything to God that they would this morning. Maybe there's someone here who's struggling with an addiction or a, a, a something that's in their life that they can't get rid of. Father, that they could bring that this morning to these steps. If there's someone who has come into this place this morning with just thinking, I, I just don't have the answers. That what they've heard this morning is, that's, that's what you've been waiting to hear. You've been waiting on them to give it up to you so that you could guide and, and, and then put light to their path. Father, whatever it may be this morning, as we pray in our seats, as we come to this altar, Father, I pray you would speak to us and speak in a way that's clear. Don't let anyone leave here this morning without hearing your call. Father, we, we don't know how many days we have left. But let them be days of great banquets where we share what you've given with those around us. And days of great calling where we offer that grace, that incredible grace, that one day while we were just sitting, wherever it was, I pray we remember it even this moment, wherever it was, we remember the call when you said, follow me. And we stood up and we followed. I pray that this morning there would be no one left in this room that hadn't answered the call to follow you. So as, as the worship team begins to play, Father, you just, you just move among us in your precious name. Amen.